It was six months ago that CBC News first reported on allegations of a toxic work environment at Rideau Hall. Since then, more than 20 sources have spoken to us about an atmosphere of bullying and harassment fueled by Julie Payette and her second in command and best friend, Asunta Di Lorenzo. Two days after our first report, the Privy Council office ordered an independent review of the claims. At the time, Payette tweeted that she was deeply concerned about the reports and welcomed the review. Weeks later, the Prime Minister continued to praise her. The Governor General has a long and uh, successful uh, role as a scientist, uh, as an astronaut. We will uh, wait for the reviewer to uh, do their work. That review is now complete, its contents reportedly scathing. Late this afternoon, Payette resigned as Governor General, effective immediately. So for more on this, let's bring in at issue Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. Good to see everybody. Um, okay, I, I sort of tried to lay out sort of how this has unfolded from the beginning of our reporting to now. Uh, maybe we'll just get everybody's reaction. Uh, Chantal, I'll start with you. Um, not surprising. Probably a big sigh of relief the second this week uh, on Parliament Hill and in Liberal offices. And I suspect a lot of the damage to the Prime Minister for making that choice was already baked in before the resignation. Hmm. Do, you, do you agree with that, Andrew, that, that the Prime Minister, uh, any questions he had around the vetting and, and the choice of this candidate are over, or are there still things to be asked? I think that those questions should be asked with a great deal more vigor at this point. Mm. Uh, the defense for not cashiering her right away was we were going to go through due process and hear all the evidence. Uh, presumably all the evidence has been heard. It'd be nice if some of it or most of it or all of it were released to the public so the public could judge. Because the more damning that evidence is, the more it calls into question the prime minister's judgment in appointing her. Much of this has been reported in the CBC and elsewhere was uh, known beforehand or should have been known by any competent vetting process. So either they didn't do the vetting and just appointed her because wouldn't it be neat to have an astronaut, or they did know about it and thought they could they could shuffle through. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, take your pick which you think is more likely. But in either case, it reflects poorly on the on the decision makers in, in question. Yeah, I mean, I guess on paper, you know, uh, she looks pretty fantastic. But but you know, some of Ashley's reporting, uh, my colleague's reporting, also showed that she got a severance package from another organization and and left under bad terms. So I mean, there was obviously some sort of issue, uh, Althea, with with the vetting or or lack thereof. Yeah, the government won't acknowledge that that is the case. I think the the good thing for the prime minister's office is this. This did not happen next week when the House of Commons is sitting. Uh, I still expect that the opposition will ask a lot of questions, questions that should be asked, frankly. Um, it seems that even uh, during that meeting between the Prime Minister and the Governor General, she refused to acknowledge that uh, she had any responsibility um, with what happened at Rideau Hall, that she acknowledged the, that people felt that there had been wrongdoing, but not that there had been wrongdoing. And in her letter, uh, she makes no mention of any personal responsibility. She does not accept personal responsibility. She seems to lay the, the blame for the wrongdoing um, at the, the foot of the office of her secretary. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the may I just add that this yeah. is the, exactly the same pattern that has occurred every step of the way where there has been workplace grievances with this prime minister. He launches an investigation right thing to do. Uh, he dismisses the people involved, whether that's Mishima Pachetti or Scott Andrews or uh, whomever. But the reports that they say, sometimes they say they will be made public, never actually get made public. There's a larger yeah. context to this as well, I think, which is how seriously do we treat the position of the governor general? This is not the first time that we've had um, inappropriate or not particularly stellar appointments to the governor general's job. And it's treated as if some, it's some kind of, I don't know, a fun patronage post. It's a position that's not only one of considerable symbolic importance, but potentially great uh, decision-making authority. Sure. We've had sure. occasions in recent years in this country where the governor general might be called upon to decide who forms the government and who might have to disregard the advice of a first minister in the process. If, yeah. if a prime minister was defeated in the House so shortly after an yeah. election and then said, well, we're not going to uh, allow anybody else yeah. to form a government, we're going to yeah. call fresh elections. But, so, but you're, not, you're, you're not doing that in a vacuum. Like, you're not walking into a room no. and expecting to be a constitutional lawyer. You have advisors around you. So is the issue that, that this was the wrong person, that we're getting trapped into, like, celebrity appointments for the GG, Chantel? No, uh, it, it's kind of a mix. And part of the problem is that uh, Andrew is totally right about the responsibilities and the importance of the role in certain circumstances. 
And yeah. yes, there is a support system. But where there is a disconnect, it's uh, between the daily life of a governor general, which I have to say is pretty social and not terribly interesting, and a lot of them have testified to that, and those rare moments where you are important. I don't think Julie Payette, forget vetting and everything, which I believe failed, I don't think that she was suited for the job. I don't think she knew which was she was signing up for, yeah. uh, and she didn't like it. I suspect she would have done better if she'd overhauled her staff once all of this started, and she did not, and that was not a good sign. But at the end of the day, who do you want? Uh, someone who fades into the woodwork but knows what he's doing? That would be David Johnson. Uh, or a star, I suspect we're going to go for the former and not the latter. Yeah, well, why can't you have both? Like, how hard could it be to find someone who because is respectful if... to employees and is smart enough to do the job? I mean, that doesn't seem like a really yeah. high bar. Uh, a lot of people who are competent are respectful of employees. That That is, this is a, a one case of, yeah. of something. But a lot of people who are competent and have achieved a lot in life do not want to be governor general. Can I just say, yes. Rosemary, just one other okay. thing is, it, 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 yes, the governor general has experts to advise him or her, yes. but he or she has to be able to carry the confidence of the public in a situation like that. That's Imagine right. if the governor general had to go against an elected prime minister in some kind of crisis like that. You would want somebody where the public said, look, I respect and admire that person, and I'm going to stick with the, the duly, you know, duly constituted yes. constitutional authority against what would be effectively a, 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 you know, a rogue prime minister. You need somebody who can command the public's confidence in that situation. And, that, and, the, and that's what you're talking about, Althea, when we look back at Mikhail Jean, which she had to do in 2008 with Stephen Harper. She, she ha you have to wear that and then convince people it is the right thing to do. Yeah, I agree with Andrew. I think in some ways, a lot of the issues that have bubbled up over the past few years make you wonder if um, the prime minister's office is really taking the time to understand whether the people it is appointing to certain positions really um, are well suited for the positions. Not just that they like the image of them and the idea of them right. in these positions, right. but that the culture around the position suits them. So Julie Payette is a prime example, but also Jody Wilson-Raybould, Jane Philpott, Clearly, Jane Philpott did not know what it was like to live in a partisan caucus and what the expectations of caucus life are. Um, and I think there, there may be a strong argument to appoint somebody with a political background mm -hmm. or a historian or somebody yeah. who understands what the constitutional yeah. role is, not just, uh, you know, pinning medals on yeah. people at Rideau Hall. You should have seen Andrew's face when you mentioned Jane Philpott. I'm not <laughs> even going to let him open that can of worms. No, 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 don't. Okay, last don't word, Chantel, there. last word, last if, word. If I can yeah. just mention what Althea said, uh, also applies, I suspect, to uh, Senate appointments. Just hours after being sworn into office, President Biden turned his campaign promise to cancel Keystone XL into a reality, revoking the pipeline's permit through executive order, a move that left Canadian officials disappointed. We respect that decision. We have to accept that and, and move forward. And left Alberta's premier calling for a response. The government of Canada must impose meaningful trade and economic sanctions in response to defend our country's vital economic interests. All right, lucky us. Another round of that issue. It's been a busy week. So Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, let's do a quick go round on this one. Um, Andrew, I'm going to start with you and this call by the premier for, for sanctions. Does this seem reasonable and, and something that should be considered? Uh, no. Uh, I think somewhere in between uh, the, pr the prime minister's position, which was, oh, well, better next next time, and uh, Mr. Kenny's call for sort of nuclear trade war uh, is, I think, the more uh, sensible ground. Uh, we are not going to change the this ruling by that. It, certainly by that means uh, any time we get into a trade war with the United States, we're lucky to you know emerge with our limbs intact. Uh, this is, of course, a, a question of domestic environmental policy in the United States. So I think we can make strenuous lobbies. We can attempt to the extent that it's possible, and I doubt there is, that, to get the decision changed. Uh, but diplomatic channels and possible legal challenges are the proper route to go, not mm -hmm. trade wars. But Althea, it, it, haven't we done everything that we could do on this file? I mean, the, the, the administration is a lot of people from the last one that killed it the first time. I just don't know what else could be done. 
Uh, I don't know if I agree with that. I think more could have been done uh, to signal the government's full uh, interest and adoration for this project and putting other priorities aside to focus uh, with its talk with the Biden administration or incoming Biden administration on this issue. But um, they knew that these people, in, who are mostly like Obama uh, sure. second term people, uh, who were in favor of killing Keystone the first time, who were maybe even involved in killing Keystone the first time, why would President Biden waste political capital on reversing a campaign pledge? Like, it makes no sense. This is a very easy thing for him to do. Like, Canada was never going to win this fight. And it's, to me, still surprising that Jason Kenney, while this election was happening, decided to invest $1.5 billion of taxpayers' money and $6.5 billion in loan guarantees mm -hmm. on a project that seemed like it was doomed to fail. Yeah. Um, apparently, this evening, uh, during the premier's call, Alberta, uh, so Kenny, Mo, and even Ford were arguing in favor uh, of tariffs. This is not going to happen. And the government's point of view is like the only reason they used it with Donald Trump is was because it really was the nuclear option that they want to move forward on things that they can do together, yeah. uh, especially on climate change. And that's where they're going. Chantal. Uh, so um, first point, public opinion in this country and the relief that uh, has been uh, caused by the departure of Donald Trump would not uh, in any way, shape or form be conducive to Justin Trudeau declaring a trade war on the Biden team on day one. Yeah. Uh, that's not going to happen. And if it were to happen, the government that would go down that road. And I noticed that I've been reading all the statements from Aaron O'Toole. I have not yet seen him echo this call for sanctions. Maybe it's coming or maybe I missed a, a press release, but very delicate for the federal conservatives. Mm -hmm. Um, we asked him specifically that, uh, his office that today, and he sent a, a wordy answer that did not say yes or no. Okay, no, Chantal, because yeah. of, uh, of course they, they, they can't uh, be going down that road. But mm -hmm. the other thing, I think picking up on Althea's point, I think Joe Biden did a uh, service to Justin Trudeau. Yes. It's, it's called ripping the Band-Aid. You can do it slowly. It's going to hurt for a long time. You can yeah. do it quickly. And if he was going to do that, and no president is going to reverse himself on something he did on day one that fulfilled yeah. the promise. Yeah, and, and, and do it and do it before an election uh, for, for Justin Trudeau, where he may have to defend himself. It also puts Jason Kenney, Andrew, in this weird position where he's calling for sanctions and then somehow uh, suddenly uh, promoting Justin Trudeau's climate plan as the reason why the, the pipeline should go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I follow that at all. I don't think a Prime Minister Kenny uh, would be launching uh, trade sanctions as a result of this, because you have, <laughs> you know, if you're in that position, you have to take a broader outlook than just what's good for the Prime Minister, sure. Premier, I should say, of Alberta. Um, but I understand his frustration. The, this is this project has been looked at any number of times in the U.S. Mm -hmm. itself, uh, and in a way, both. Premier Kenny and some of the project's most fervent opponents exaggerate the stakes here. The, the oil sands are not going to live or die depending on whether Keystone itself gets built, and neither would Keystone in itself, you know, destroy the environment. It, the, the, the oil is going to get to market one way or another. If it doesn't do so by, the, by means of the Keystone pipeline, it will do so in other ways. So that alone would make the case this is not the, the, yeah. the kind of... Um, be all and end all type of thing where the government has to, it, there's some sort of existential threat either to Canada or to Alberta that would warrant that kind of extreme measure. So this is, so this is it. We just sort of say, okay, and, and move on. Is that, is that sort of where this is going then, Althea? Uh, well, that's Chantal, the Chantal and then Althea. Okay. Chantal and then Althea. Go ahead. Uh, I expect the prime minister to raise it uh, in his first phone conversation yeah. with President Biden. I expect to see it in the debrief. I'm not sure I expect to see it ever, ever again. again. Okay, Althea, last word. I don't disagree with what Chantal said. Uh, their first call tomorrow. Uh, we already know from uh, Biden's spokesperson that that is the issue on the agenda. Um, it is something the Prime Minister's office says they want to talk about too, but uh, they also want to quickly move on to talk about things where they can work together, like selling hydro from Quebec and Manitoba and British Columbia to the U.S. and working on maybe ensuring that Canada doesn't get affected by Buy American provisions and yes. help with freeing the two Michaels. And so there's a laundry list of things that they actually want to get to in that first phone call. And they will do the 
um, Justin Trudeau will say his bit, President Biden will say his bit, and, and that will be it. Okay, smart. Smart, all of you. Thank you. Appreciate this and appreciate you pivoting subjects, given it's been such a busy news day. Thank you. Before we go, uh, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast. We've got extra content there this week. We're talking about Conservative MP Derek Sloan, who was voted out of caucus. Yeah, that happened this week, too. Look for it on any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national.